So sick of being stuck on base. Yeah, I feel like we've done all this training for nothing. I've never even fired my gun! Tell me about it. I've been using this minesweeper for six years and never found anything. What do you say, boys? Oh, yeah. Yeah! Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah! Who is that? I think they're from the dollar store. You guys ready for this? I've never been more ready in my life. Oh! Come on, guys, let's move out. Finally, some action. Charlie, Alpha, Victor, Bravo, we need air support in here now. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, guys. All right, I think I found the mine. I found one, I found one, I found one, I found one. Yeah, I love that part. It's one of my favorites. Um, Living the Adventure. This is part two of the series, and this is a really exciting series because when we see Christianity, when we see Jesus, we're talking about an adventure. It's not supposed to be just some faith we come uh, to celebrate God on a Sunday and that is it. We're not just supposed to be chair warmers. We're not just supposed to be complacent in our faith. And we're supposed to be living this adventure that God has called every single Christian to experience. Because if we're honest here, we see the Bible and we see the things that happen in it, and those guys are having an adventure. Those guys are doing amazing things because God is working through them. And sometimes that that's, doesn't happen so often. We don't recognize that so often. I mean, the things we see in the Bible, we can't dismiss that this is an adventure. We see people laying hands, God using them to lay hands on the sick, and they recover. We see people raising and rising from the dead. We see people... Uh, coming to Jesus amazingly, like from a broken life to a restored life. We see so many awesome things, the blessings of God and, and God's provision. I can go on and on. There's so many things that we see in the scripture that just blow my mind, and that's part of the adventure. It's not just, we're getting it wrong if we think it's just coming to church and sitting here and warming a chair and only hearing a message but not leaving here any different by not applying what we learn outside the four walls of this church. It's so much more, and it's so much deeper than that. When I, when I, I'm going to say I signed up for Christianity. I dedicated and, and surrendered my heart over to Jesus. And when I signed up for this, I didn't sign up for a dull, boring, religious festival. That wasn't something that I really wanted. I wanted more. I wanted to experience the same God of the Bible. I wanted to experience the same type of faith, the same type of of miracles, the same type of God that I see on these pages, because honestly, that Bible represents the God that we believe in. That blows my mind. I mean, he is, that same God is from that scripture. We should do a double take on that, because that should really rock us and blow our minds. That same God that we, that we serve, that we believe in, that we come and worship, that we sing to, he's that same God that we see on those pages of the Bible. So he is alive, and he is well, and he wants to use us, and that's what I want. I'm not about just playing church, and I hope that we're not just about playing church. I hope we really want to live this adventure. We signed up to do so. If we've made that commitment to Jesus, that's what we want to experience, that adventure. Not something boring, not something stuffy, and we see so many people in the Bible living that adventure as well. But of course, when it comes to living the adventure, there's so many things that, that seem to get in the way, don't they? They seem, to just, they seem to take our attention off the adventure that God wants us to live. Have you noticed that? You're going through life and you're, okay, Jesus, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to live for you. And all of a sudden, stuff happens. And wow, maybe it's life struggles. Maybe it's habits or hang-ups or addictions. Maybe it's a financial issue that comes up. I can go on and on. A disease. You're plagued with something. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe you're scared and you're nervous. I can go on and on because so many things that, that, that we face throughout the week that can totally get us off course of this Jesus thing. And we can look at these things and we can call them giants because they seem so huge, they seem so big, and we hardly can overcome them. And those giants, friends can definitely discourage us on this adventure that we're supposed to be living. 
And when we get discouraged, several things can happen. And uh, a couple of those things are like this. Sometimes we're living this adventure, and all of a sudden bad things start happening throughout your week, things that you can't control, things that just seem too tough, and you say, I believe in Jesus, I'll go to church, but I'm not going to go any further than that. I'm going to become complacent in my faith to not go any further. Some of us have that mindset. We believe it, we're secured for heaven, and that's it. Nothing else. Another thing we can experience is we can leave our faith. Our faith can become shipwrecked. And we can say, these giants are too much for us. I quit. You raise the white flag, and you just give up. And of course, the third thing, and this is the thing we all should strive for, the third thing is this, is we press on. When giants surround us, when we're getting bullied, picked on, poked on, insulted, beat up, when we're surrounded by giants everywhere we go, that's not a time to quit. That's a time to persevere. That's a time to hold on to Jesus. And that's a time that we just keep going and pressing on. Because in the end, though it may seem overwhelming right now, in the end, it is worth it to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what I want to experience. And I pray we want to experience the same exact thing. There's a story that we're, kind of, we're, we're talking about throughout this series, and we find it in the Bible. Um, it's in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17. And real quickly, before we jump into everything, I want to start you out. We see... Uh, the story of David and Goliath. And we're going to use this story to kind of take some things out of it to apply to our lives so we can see God do amazing things so we can live this adventure to the full. To have life, like Jesus says, and life to the full. Um, and in 1 Samuel, we're seeing this. I'm going to set it up for you. I'm not going to read it to you. I just want to set it up. We'll, we'll dissect the scripture in a minute. Um, we see two groups of people. We see the Israelites and we see the Philistines. There's a rivalry going on here. And we have the Israelites over here, a valley separating them, and over here we have the Philistines. Now the Philistines had this big warrior, this champion. Actually, they had several champions, but we're going to talk about the one right now, named Goliath. Goliath was a big guy. Goliath was over nine feet tall, the scripture says. That's, I'm 5'8". Hi. He would knock me over. Goliath was a big guy. And Goliath was a bully. Goliath would come out every day. It says for 40 days he would come out and terrorize the Israelites. He would shout insults at them. And he would defy God whom they serve. He would say, come on you chickens. Come on you wimps. Fight me. Send me somebody. You're nothing. You're God's nothing. You guys are worthless. All that stuff. Just, just poking insults at David. And uh, Goliath was kind of like that school bully that we've all have experienced potentially or, or have seen a friend experience. He was a jerk. He would be the guy who would knock the books out of your hand or flick your ears on the bus. Just annoying and you know, gets underneath your skin. You just get so frustrated. And uh, one day, this teenage boy, get this, a teenage boy named David starts and he wants to stand up against this bully. Teenage boy named David, I forget how old he may have been, but obviously a teenager, so he's a young man. And he's not, no, nine over nine feet tall. <laughs> he's just starting to grow and fully mature. And so maybe five feet something. Still, no match for Goliath. And uh, we see Goliath being such a bully that the Israelites would run from him in terror. Ah, oh, it's Goliath, run! But we would see David say, not me. I'm going to stand up to this guy, this bully, this jerk. And I'm going to have courage, and I'm going to trust in my God. So we're going to see something from David. We've seen the first thing last week from David, and that was David had courage to stand up. And this week, we're going to talk about the second principle when it comes to living the adventure that God has for every single one of us, and that's this, and it's in your outlines. To live God's adventure, it takes faith. Friends, and David 
has that faith. But what is faith? We come in here and we're like, is that just, what is faith? I don't understand it too well, so let's talk about it. We're going to talk about faith. What faith is, in your outlines here, is faith is trust or confidence to lean on or rest on. And some of us may be like, well, I don't really have that faith. Of course you do. Let me tell you something. You showed faith coming here today. When you came through those doors today, you came through, I didn't see anybody trying to wiggle the foundation of the building. Hmm, is this up the code? Is this good? Uh, I didn't see anybody do that. What'd you do? You walked in. I didn't see anybody going, oh, is this board gonna, gonna hold me? There was none of that. There was no tiptoeing to make sure it doesn't give out on you. You came in this building and it did not fall on you. Lightning did not strike us. You showed faith that there was gonna be a service today. Another example would be you walked to your chairs today. None of you had any wrenches or screwdrivers with you. None of you looked underneath the chair and said, I wonder if there are all these nuts and bolts and screws are in line so I can hold me in this chair. None of you said that. In fact, we all plopped our butts down. And it held us, didn't it? Because we had confidence that it would. We showed faith. We showed trust. And we showed confidence. And of course, that's not a spiritual faith. That's not a spiritual type of faith. But it's an example of what faith is. And uh, God's word tells us what faith is. Found in Hebrews chapter 11. It's in your outlines. It says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And we see that example demonstrated by David when he's facing Goliath. David had all the reason to run if he's looking at things through the physical sense. This guy's big. Let's run away. Like everybody else was doing. And uh, I want to show you a conversation that takes place to kind of show you David's faith and where he was at with this whole thing, where his heart was at and who he trusted in. There's a conversation that took place between David and Saul. Saul was the king of Israel. He was the head honcho. He was the man. And this was a guy who was supposed to be leading God's people. He was supposed to be hearing from God and leading like God would have him lead. But we don't see that from Saul. So we have David a teenager talking to the king of Israel. That's big. That's like one of us talking to the president. All right? So let's read what happened. Let's look at the conversation here. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to check out 32, 33, 37, 40, and 45. So let's start from 32. It says, David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Let no one lose heart on this guy, this bully. Your servant David will go and fight him. So David's expressing faith right here. Don't, don't lose heart when those giants are around you. Man, he's just a bully. He needs put in his place. He can't tell me what to do, and he can't tell me that I'm nothing. He can't call me a wimp. Do you know who I serve? I serve God who is bigger than this giant. And so David had a mission. The mission was to face the giant and defeat the giant. But look what Saul says. Saul says this. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he has been a fighting man from his youth. So Saul, Mr. Supposed to be a warrior, a battle, okay, he's supposed to be in the battlefield, supposed to be leading his people, started speaking like the cowardly lion. You, you, you can't do that. He started stuttering, right? And he knew he couldn't beat the giant. He knew that with his skill, he knew how big the giant was. He just didn't match up on his own power. I can't do this. So he was speaking out of his experience. He was saying, no, 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 David. Uh-uh, boy, you cannot go against that giant. He is way too big for you. He'll chew you up and spit you out and throw you on the ground and step on you. But David had confidence and trust that that would not happen. His trust was in God. He knew who was on his side. David had courage. Where did that courage come from? He wasn't seeing it from the people of Israel. He wasn't seeing it from Saul. David had courage in something totally different. You see, Saul and the people of Israel, Israel were operating out of a fear paradigm. Everything was fear. Everything was fear. 
but we see in David's case, courage is the result of a faith paradigm. We get courage to face the issues that are going on, to face the giants that are challenging us and smiting us and everything else throughout the week by Jesus, by the one who can give us courage. We have to change our perspective and our lenses. We have to change our vision. Some of us have so much tunnel vision on fear and the negative and on what God doesn't say instead of the faith, instead of the God we believe in, the things he does say. In fact, this should give us courage and we hear that Jesus saying, I am with you always, even until the end of this age. It should give us courage and trust and a confidence in this God when we hear the things like, I am for you and not against you. It should give us courage to hear from God when he says, I have a plan for your life. And get this last one, because this really blows my mind. It should give us courage because it is written in the scripture that the same spirit who was active who was alive, who was in Jesus Christ when he rose from the dead. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead is alive and at work in us and has given life to our mortal bodies. That is big. You had the same exact spirit of God at work in your life right now, the same one who did this, thing, this amazing thing in Jesus who rose him from the dead. It's in us at this moment. That's huge. That means there's no limits. That means God's in control, and that should give us courage that we're not on this battlefield alone, that we can live this adventure the way God intended us to. When we allow God to change our perspective, we start operating out of a faith paradigm. We start lining our life up with what he says. We start looking at things through what the scripture says and what God says about us. It's going to change the way we look at life. And we begin to trust. And we develop this, this courage to step up against these giants on our day-to-day -day issues. I mean, so we can trust God for if we have cancer, or if we have a, a disease, or we have something going on in our bodies, we can trust that God is our healer, and he can help us through. He can give us the courage to step up and say, God, I trust in you to get me through this disorder, this disease, this whatever it is. We can trust God and expect him to get us through the tough times throughout the week. We can expect God to get us through financial issues, to expect him to get us through the depression that we have throughout the week or any other battle that we may be facing. Maybe it's a sin or a temptation. We can trust in God and he can give us courage to overcome these things. That's the God that we serve. That's a big God because that same spirit is living in us as well. And David understood that. And so those giants that we face throughout the week, you name it. You put that giant in there because I can't tell you exactly what you're facing. But only you know and God knows and maybe your friends and family. But understand, those giants are nothing but temporary bullies. They stand their ground and look big, bad, and tough for a little season. But guess who you have on your side? You have Jesus. And who Jesus is is a giant slayer. Uh-oh. Suddenly the game has, has turned, the tables have turned. Because now when you go face that giant with the giant slayer named Jesus, that giant has two choices. That giant can run. Ah, Jesus is here! Run away. Or that giant dies. That's it. It runs or flees or it dies. That's the power of Jesus. That's the power of having him work through your life and cooperating with him. God is in control. And we see David having that type of faith. But Saul didn't. Saul didn't have that faith. Saul was speaking out of his assumptions and his experience and his feelings. Okay, yeah, I know I believe in this God, but I don't know. I, I, I got to do everything in my own power. I don't know if God can do this part. So David, don't do it. Truthfully, as we all have witnessed, and this shows us the following in your outlines, people do not always share your faith or confidence. It may become a tool of the enemy to discourage you. We've all witnessed those negative Nancys, haven't we? You say the sky's blue, they're going to say the sky's gray. The sky's blue, it's gray. You can say things like, 
I'm going to save up and, and go on vacation this year because I haven't been there. Well, good luck. Look at the economy. It's terrible. You're never going to have money. But, um, nope. Hmm. All right. We've witnessed those people. What about the people who say, we're going to go, hey, we're going to church today because Jesus changed my life and I'm, I love open arms or I love this church or I love that church. And then you hear the naysayers. Well, it's only a matter of time until they, you, they show you their true colors, that they're all a bunch of hypocrites. Hmm. Well, I'm here to tell you that, yes, we all are hypocritical at times because we're all imperfect people. <laughs> if we were perfect, hey, it'd be boring. <laughs> One day we will be like Jesus. But those are naysayers. And those are those negative Nancys. And people do not always experience or, or share the same exact belief system as us. And it can definitely discourage us, can it? Because you're all gung-ho. Woo, we got this. We're going to face this giant. We're going to go celebrate God. We're going to do this and that. Nope. Mm. It definitely twists us a little bit and definitely discourages us a little bit. And that can easily discourage us into thinking the exact opposite of what faith is, the way God intended us to have this faith. In fact, what's the opposite of faith? That's fear. And in your outlines, what is fear? Fear is faith in reverse. It's faith, but in the opposite direction, with a negative result. I'll tell you a quick story. Oh, I was this type of guy who had nothing but a fear perspective, who showed faith in fear instead of my faith in God. When I was 14, I was diagnosed with anxiety and panic attacks. And uh, I eventually came to Jesus. And I knew what the Bible said about things. I knew what Jesus wanted to do in my life. I knew he was my healer and everything else. But that, couldn't, that didn't change anything because I was operating out of a fear perspective. I was afraid of dying. I had a huge fear of dying and leaving this world. Even of belief in Jesus and even knowing what comes next, I still had this huge fear. And I'm going to be honest, at times it may try to come back and sneak up on me because they are bullies, giants are bullies, and we have to fight those giants. And I'll tell you, I was operating out of fear. I would go to a doctor over and over and over and over again every time I got a little pain in my chest every time I got a little shortness of breath, or every time I got a little uh, shaky or whatever, you name it, I would go to a doctor. And I already had a mega test done. I already had a lot of tests done, but it wasn't good enough because it wasn't sinking in because I thrived on fear. I was letting fear guide my life and have its way with me, to hold me captive and in bondage so I could not live the adventure that God had for me. It wasn't until I switched my perspective and started, okay, doctor said there was nothing wrong with me. Okay, God is with me, and he's with me all the time, and he, he's healed me, he is working through me, and he is helping me slay this giant of anxiety and panic attacks. And finally, friends, life started turning around. I was no longer operating out of a fear perspective. I was operating out of a faith perspective because what came out of my mouth was molding who God wanted me to be. There was power in my words. There was power in my thoughts. And there was power in my God whom I served. And so I had to recognize that fear really tried to consume me, but God is bigger. My, my faith came from Jesus to overcome that issue and that giant. Just like your faith will come from Jesus to overcome that giant and that issue in your life right now and today. See, David's faith came from the Lord as well. And we see that when he went up to face against Goliath. Read with me the continuation of, of uh, Saul and David's story or, or their conversation here. It says, But David said to Saul, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. David was sold. I know who God is. He's on my side. I know who Israel serves. He's on our side. He is God and he is bigger than me. I mean... It didn't matter what Saul said. Think about it. If God says, if the scripture says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Shouldn't that bring us faith and courage in who God is? If Jesus himself said, you'll do even greater things than I did, shouldn't that give us courage? Shouldn't that give us strength and faith to overcome the issues that we face on a daily basis? If we believe he rose from the dead 
And we believe the same God is the same on those pages of the Bible that is living in us today. That should bring us faith and confidence in who he is to help us slay these giants throughout the week. I mean, think about it. If you struggle with addiction, Jesus says, I have come to set the captive free. If you struggle with depression, Jesus says, God says, I am near to the brokenhearted. You struggle with relational turmoil? Guess what Jesus already did for you? He slayed the giant in advance for us. In fact, he paved the way. He said, love one another. Show love to one another and be humble. Love each other as I have loved you. That's the antidote for relational turmoil. Love, sacrifice, and doing things God's way. He's already provided a way. You're facing the giant of financial insecurity? God says, I am your provider. And I encourage you, take him for his word and tithe. Show God that he does not, that he has every place in your heart and not finances. And watch the blessings come through. Watch God answer your prayers. Watch God make sure that everything is provided for you and so on and so forth. In fact, so much, there's not enough room to contain it all. And I'm not giving no prosperity message. I'm just telling you that God is our provider. And sometimes it takes us stepping out in faith to show him that we trust in him. And that does mean tithing at times. And it does also means giving an offering or being generous with your income because it's all a gift from God. Take him for his word. Don't just hear it in the scripture. Follow what he says because he is a God of his word. He is faithful to his promises. You have to have a real faith and a real confidence in who he is. It has to be your faith. You have to own it and realize who God is. In fact, in your outlines, your faith must be yours, unmoved by the opinions of others. It can't be your pastor's faith. It can't be your friend's faith. It can't be your family member's faith. It has to be only your personal faith, your commitment to Jesus. You know, Pastor Mike has always been a great mentor to me. And he's helped me and, and guided me along the way. God has used him in tremendous ways. And he told me something, and I think he even shared it in the message one time, or a few times. This faith has to be our own thing. You know, if somebody talks, he says, if somebody talks you into Jesus, if somebody's saying, well, this God is really good and you have to experience it, all you got to do is do this and that, and you're just listening to that person but not having a real authentic experience to claim that faith as your own, it's only a matter of time until somebody smarter, somebody more intelligent, will come along and say, this God isn't real, and talk you out of God. You see, you have to claim that faith as something as your own, not somebody else's faith. It has to be yours. It's only a matter of time. If you don't have that relationship with God and it's not your relationship, it's somebody else's you're living off of, if it's not your faith, it's only a matter of time till life starts crashing in around you, till bad things start happening, till a death happens in the family and you don't understand why, until you're, you have a disease, health issues start coming up and you don't know why. Something happens financially in your family and you don't know, like, oh my goodness, you're just so overwhelmed. One of your children gets sick. Whatever it is, giants will come, and they will overwhelm us. And it's only a matter of time, if we don't have that faith claimed as our own, that you begin to say the following things. God doesn't love me. No, he loves this person over there. Look what he's doing to those people. He's not doing it for me. He doesn't love me. Or you'll say, this God isn't even real. Nothing but fluff and stuff. That book, garbage. That church, they believe in a fairy tale. You see, because it wasn't your faith, you lived off of somebody else's. It has to be personal. It has to be yours. Jesus has to become your everything. You have to surrender and say, I claim you as mine. Because he honestly does claim you as his. When you give your life over to him, he sets a deposit, a seal of approval upon you saying, this one is mine. He gives you his Holy Spirit. And that means that he is yours and you are his. And you're in a relationship with him. And so it's real. See, David had this type of faith. 
David understood who God was. And Saul knew that David was amped to go face this giant. He knew that he had faith, and he wasn't going to be stopped, and he was going to go do it. Read with me what, what Saul says here. He still adds his two cents, though. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Okay, got my approval. Go on, buddy. But then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. That's Saul saying, here, put this on. You'll need it. Here. And there's several reasons why Saul may have done that. Obviously, lack of faith in God, so he thought it would be in his armor and everything else. Or also, Saul maybe had a little bit of a heart condition, a conceitedness about him to where he wanted people to think that was him in the battlefield. I don't know. That's just assumption. But ultimately, in your outlines... Sometimes those who seem to support you may try to influence you to put your trust in tools, strategies, strength, and the wisdom of man. Like we said earlier, people may not share your faith. Shocker. We experience that every day, don't we? And uh, sometimes people have more faith in the natural than the supernatural. It's easy to have faith in the things that we see and not, the thing, and not in the things we don't see. But God doesn't operate the same way we do. He doesn't always use ordinary, everyday things to accomplish his purpose and plan and his will. Sometimes, and oftentimes, it's supernatural. And so, your friends, your family, your coworkers may have various, a very sincere heart in saying, you say one thing that God says, and all of a sudden, they say, hmm, you, you, I understand what you're saying, but you may want to do it this way instead. Understand, if God speaks to you and is clear, you have to do it his way. That's how you get the best results, and it takes faith to do so. And honestly, honestly, uh, man doesn't always have the answers. Let's be honest. We don't know everything like we think we do. And you can ask, just ask doctors. Yes, doctors are blessings and they're gifted, but sometimes they don't have an answer for certain things. They put their hands up in the air. I don't know. I've tried everything I could. I can't help you anymore. Just ask the latest diet guru. Hey, these are good for you one day, but next day they're not. Eat some eggs. Don't eat eggs. Drink some milk. Don't drink milk. Use this. Not that. It changes. We don't know everything. We know the basics. But we don't know everything. Ask... Ask science. And this isn't a slam on science, but things do keep changing. We got some things figured out, but you can't figure out God all the way. Things change. We don't have the answers for everything. Sometimes we get it right. Some things we get wrong. We don't always want to admit that, do we? But we don't have the answers. In fact, God does. And the scripture is pretty clear. The Bible talks about trusting in man versus trusting in God and how we should always go to God first, above everything. And of course, he uses people to accomplish even more at times, and that's okay. But read it, it's actually not in your outlines, but you want to reference this. It's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5 through 7. Um, it says, this is what the Lord says, Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength, and turn their hearts away from the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose trust is the Lord. So trust in God above everything else. That's vital, and that's how we live by faith. Moving on, we see David and Saul continuing their conversation. It says, I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. What just happened? David said, I'm not using your stuff. I can't walk in these. I can't do anything. It's too heavy. Saul, I'm not doing it. I know what God said to do, and that's what I'm going to do. Nothing else. You really can't tell me that this is the way I should do it if I heard from God and he said to do it this way. David didn't need Saul's armor. David was David, and David heard from God, and David did what God wanted David to do, and that was it. David simply David, a child of God. And in fact, just like us today, David had his own faith, and he heard from God, and God told him what to do, so we should have the same exact way of approach of doing things. You are you, and we need to have our own faith and be who God made us to be. 
we have to stay true to what God, who God wants us to be. See, we're not going to be Pastor Mike. We're not going to be Justin. We're gonna be, you're not going to be your person next to you. You have to have your own faith in that direction. You're not going to look the same as everybody else. It may look different from person to person. God wants to shape and mold you who we want you to be. That's it. Faith requires you to stay true to who God made you to be, not try to be someone else. Many will try to make us into something that we are not, simply are not. You see, there's, there's the fundamentals of being a Christian. There's, there's surrendering your heart over to Jesus and following what he says to do, following God, believing that Bible, surrendering our hearts over to him, drawing closer to him and allowing us to mold us, allowing him to mold us into who he wants us to be by believing the fundamentals of he died for us and rose again, that there's a heaven to gain and a hell to avoid, that God wants to have, want us to have life and life to the full. I can go on and on. There's so many things that are fundamentals that we can believe and we can trust as Christians, but you know what? There are some things that may look different from person to person. He may have gifted you in one area and the person next to you in a different area. Believe me, I'm not going to go put on a new brand new door. I'll put it on backwards and upside down. I'll probably install it on the floor. I don't know. I'm not a handyman, but I know some of us are. I can't go operate on a dog or a cat. I'll transplant its heart to its brain. Dr. Brad is gifted in doing that stuff. That's not me. So our, our gifts and everything else will be different. But truth of Jesus and the, being a Christian and the fundamentals will stay the same, if you get me on that. We're not all the same. So David didn't want Saul's stuff or his opinion. David simply wanted God. And David listened to what God said. So moving on to verse 40, it says, Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Okay, so David's living by faith, right? But why does he go out and grab five stones? I thought this guy had faith. Is it because, well, in case I miss, I'm going to have four extra to use? No. In fact, like I said earlier, the Philistines had multiple warriors or champions. And understand that Goliath was one of those, but Goliath also had four brothers. So David was just going into this thing like, uh, well, I'm going to take Goliath out. He's saying, these guys are all bullies, and I'm going to take them all out. So one stone for each giant. That's all he needed. He didn't need a sword. He didn't need a spear. One stone for each giant. And you get the references in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 18 through 22. And that's where you can see the reference of Goliath having his brothers. And truthfully, that's all you need is one stone. The rock of our salvation is Jesus Christ. He is that boulder. He is that rock. He is that stone that we use to overcome those giants, to take those giants out. He is our stone to take out the stuff that happens to us throughout this week. David's face all the more clear as he stood to face the giant and said this. So we have David standing with Goliath in front of Goliath. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Wow. David comes at it humbly. He doesn't say, Here I am. Check out the sides of this sword, baby. I'm going to chop your head off. No, he didn't say that. He said, I come with God, the, ar- the Lord, the one in charge of the army of Israel, the one I surrender to, the one I serve, and that's God Almighty, and I'm facing you, Goliath. He brought the main inventor with him. So really, it was an unfair matchup. Not necessarily Goliath being unfair to David, but really it was David and God taking on Goliath. That was unfair for Goliath little different perspective on looking at things. David trusted in his heavenly father, just like we all should trust in our heavenly father. There is such a size difference, or not just a size difference with David and Goliath. It's not, there's such a difference between the two. Yeah, obviously there's a height comparison. Hello, Goliath, you're really big. It's more to it than that. You see, 
when it comes to their faith, there's a huge difference as well. In your outlines, David's faith was in the Lord. Goliath had faith in himself. Hmm. Goliath had faith in himself. And the difference in faith, friends, made the world of difference. It really did. See, Goliath believed in his, in his, uh, in his sword and his, his armor and his size and experience. I'm big, I'm bad, I'm going to beat you up, is what he was saying. David, God is with me, and I'm going to take you out. Simple. So that's a real giant that David fought with the help of the Lord. And so many of us, friends, we walk in here and uh, we're stressing out because we're lining up to face Goliath and we're relying on the answers that we can get for ourselves. We're relying on our experience to face an issue. We're relying on the things of this world. And though those things can be used, I'm not demonizing anything here, but our first, the first thing we should always do is, is not in our hands first. It goes to him first. We surrender it over to him, and then he'll tell us what we need to do. It's usually the opposite. Usually we, we freak out. Ah, got to do this, got to do that, got to do this. I know I've done it. Instead of saying, God, what do I do? We say, this is what we're going to do. God bless it. It's kind of a different way of doing it. We should do it the opposite way. God, what do you want me to do in this situation? And when it comes to us surrendering, when we come up and line up to that giant that we're facing throughout the week, when it comes to us surrendering, it's when we put our hands up and surrender that God fights for us. And that's big. That's how the Lord fights our battles. We surrender. And we put our hands up in the air, and he fights the battle for us. Because no longer are we like this, to try to put things in our own power. We're like this, and he takes over, and he does what he wants through us. That's where faith comes in. And as David's faith empowered him to act and step up to this giant, notice in your outlines, we're going to close with the scripture in James chapter 2, verse 17. In the same way, Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So not only do we say we have the faith, we've got to show we have the faith. We've got to step out into the battlefield to live that adventure. Not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. You see, so many of us walk around with poser-like Christianity. We believe what it's, we hear what it says, but to actually do what it says is something that's a little harder to do. But once we step out in faith, we see God do an amazing work. And that's when we can experience the same God that's written on the pages in the Bible. It's not going to happen we all do things in our own power, because who needs God if we're going to do everything on our own power? He wants to help us and fight the battles through us. We have to surrender it over to him. We don't want a poser faith. We want God to help us through this life, to face those giants and to face those battles for us. We have to walk the walk. So when you leave here today, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what giants are out there today. I don't know your life, but I'm telling you, God does, and he sees you, and he hears you, and he loves you, and he is with you, and he's just waiting for that moment to see you surrender everything over to him so you no longer fight, but him fighting with you and for you. Let's close our eyes quickly here. I just want us to examine our life really quick. Not to focus on the people around us, but just focus on our lives and, and how we're living right now. And you know the giants that are bullying you. You know the things that are in the way between you and God to live this adventure. And God is going to bring those to your mind right now if we're truly open and hearing from him. And today is your opportunity to surrender everything to Jesus. Surrender things to Jesus and allow him to fight for you. Only you know what needs to be surrendered. We have a big God who says, I am for you. 
who says, I love you, and it says, I'm with you always. And we're going to trust that God today. And we're going to say a prayer together to commit our lives to him so we can fight these battles with him and not just by ourselves. If you're feeling led, if God's putting on your heart to, to recharge, to surrender everything over to him and to leave here differently today, then I want to say this prayer with you with the rest of our church family. We're all going to pray together so nobody feels awkward or left out or uncomfortable. And you're just going to repeat after me. But remember, it's not what you say that's going to do anything. It's more to it than just talking. Remember, we talked about that. It has to be with action. So you have to believe it and believe it with your whole heart. Claim it as your own faith, not just going through a ritual at church, and a repetitive prayer, and walking away. This is your moment with God to have him help you fight these giants. Let's pray. Repeat after me. Father God, I need you. I feel helpless, overwhelmed, scared, frustrated. I can go on and on. Today I ask Jesus to take charge of my life. I surrender my life to you. Jesus, I trust you to help me through life. Help me to face these giants and to defeat them. I am yours. You are mine, and I claim you. I put my trust and confidence in you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.